Welcome to Your Gal Friday, a podcast about female leaders, innovators, and rule breakers. Each week, your hosts, Kate and Phoebe, will shine a spotlight on an amazing gal and talk about what we can all learn from her. Brought to you by Gal's Guide to the Galaxy. Welcome to Your Gal Friday. I'm Kate Chaplin. And I'm Phoebe Freer. Today we're going to talk about a remarkable rebel. Born into slavery, she not only escaped, but she made multiple rescue missions to save her family and friends. In the Civil War, she was a nurse, an armed scout, and a spy. She was the first woman to lead wartime troops. In 1865, it took three men to physically throw her into another train car after she insisted she had the right to sit wherever she wanted. She was a speaker for abolition, for women's rights, for temperance, and for civil rights. Today, we're talking about the life and legacy of your gal, Harriet Tubman. I've honestly been looking forward to this week since the start of the show. I am so excited for this week. Harriet Tubman has been one of my heroes since I was a child. And back when I was in sixth grade, we all had to write this research report on a famous American hero. And my brother was actually a year ahead of me, and he chose Harriet Tubman. Well, when I got to sixth grade, I looked through the list to consider each person for my own self, and I also decided that Harriet Tubman was leaps and bounds the best person on the list, like nice. hands down, yeah. And but I almost wasn't allowed to write about her because my brother had done it the year before. My uh, teacher was worried that I wanted to like copy his report. Right. That wasn't the case at all, and I was right. really devastated. But thankfully, my teacher let me write this report, and now there's we've I have both copies, both my brother's and mine, and I actually haven't um I hadn't read my brother's report up until recently when we were researching for this podcast, so I think that that's Very cool. really cool. Yeah, it's really fun to what sixth grade Phoebe had to say about Harriet Tubman, and then what we're <laughs> learning now, you know. <laughs> Oh, that's perfect. It's like time in a bottle. Actually, another reason that Harriet really excites me is that I actually live in an area in Pennsylvania where the Underground Railroad um, goes through. So I kind of feel like I'm living in the middle of history and it kind of makes me really excited um, that people like Harriet exist. That is super cool. I'm in Indiana. I'm in the crossroads of America. But you know what? That Pennsylvania is uh, its littered with the Underground Railroad, which is very, very cool. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's really awesome. <laughs> So what about you, Kate? What was your first knowledge of Harriet Tubman? Well, I had a, a basic knowledge of her uh, from school and also museums. Uh, but this March, my family and I, we took a trip to the Women's Rights Museum in Rochester, New York. And the park ranger mentioned that Harriet Tubman's home and museum was only a few minutes down the road. Now, my youngest daughter said that she was learning about Harriet in school. And she, it kind of seemed like she wasn't really connecting with Harriet. So we thought maybe we should go to the museum, you know, to help her out right. with her schooling and to kind of bring Harriet alive for her. So at the museum, we were so privileged to meet Paul, and I will never forget his name because he was so amazing. Uh, he not only gave us like a wonderful and passionate history about Harriet, but he also spoke directly to my youngest. Uh, he truly oh, cool. made Harriet come to life for her and for us. Uh, my youngest, we now just adore Harriet. So, I mean, kudos, Yay. kudos to Paul. <laughs> Totally. That's so cool. <laughs> so I hope in for this episode and actually for all of our episodes that we kind of invoke that infectious energy that Paul had oh, for totally. my daughter, right? Because yeah. um, bringing the history to life is so important. Um, I actually yeah. learned this this week, and I think it really relates to the show and this episode. And it's from Deepak Chopra. It says, when you speak through the eyes, you change the way other people see. When you speak through the heart, you change the way people feel. But when you speak through a life, you change other people's lives. And I'm just like, I think that's just so isn't that cool. kind of what we try to do? <laughs> Absolutely. It really is. Oh, my goodness. 
So I thought that was fitting with uh, with Harriet and then also with the show. <laughs> totally. I love it. That is such a cool quote. <laughs> I dig it. Well, let's get into it, shall we? Should we get into our childhood? Let's do it. All right. Yeah, let's do it. So Harriet was born a slave in Maryland around 1820. Her name was actually Armentia or Minty Ross. Harriet is actually her mother's name. Now, I actually have to add in here that my husband does genealogy and my great grandmother's name was also Armentia and her nickname Aww. was Minty. Uh, That's just so adorable. I know, isn't it? I I only know of her through records and family stories, but I always remember the name. I just thought the name was right. so unique and cute and rare. And so that was the first time when Paul <laughs> told us her right. real name. I'm like, wait a minute, my great grandmother has the same name. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> I thought it was a wonderful connection. Well, now, Harriet had nine brothers and sisters. Three of her sisters were sold off and separated from the family. When slave traders came for her brother Moses, it is said that Harriet's mother hid Moses and threatened to hurt anyone who entered her home trying to take him. It is possible that this is where Harriet first saw that resistance and good trouble can actually work. So when Harriet was six, she was considered old enough to work as a slave. Her master, Edward Brodus, rented her out to different people for labor. She would also weave baskets and check musket scraps and do various housekeeping. And she was also a nursemaid. Now, while she was a nursemaid, she was supposed to keep little babies from crying at night and not wake the parents. But Harriet failed and she got punished. People kept sending Harriet back to her owner Brodus for one reason or another, sometimes for acting out. One reason was because she got the measles because of setting traps. Another one was because she ate a sugar cube. My goodness. Ooh, she was such a trouble child. So oh trouble. Goodness. Oh, that acting out, having a sugar right? cube. She's yeah. a oh, kid no. for crying out loud. <laughs> Right. <laughs> but when Harriet was around the age of 12, she was sent to a dry goods store where she witnessed a slave trying to escape. The overseer told Harriet to tie up the slave so that he could be punished. Now, many stories say that she refused. Others say she went as far as to block the door and give time for the slave to run away. Now, the overseer oh, wow. threw a two pound metal weight, meaning to hit the slave that was escaping, but it hit Harriet in the head instead dead. Harriet said this quote broke her skull. She later explained the, her belief that her hair, which quote had never been combed and stood out like a bushel basket, might have saved her life. After a couple of days of recovery and without medical treatment, Harriet was sent back to the fields. She started having dizzy spells and her owner didn't find it worth to keep paying for her, so he sent her back to Brodus. Now, Harriet had epileptic seizures she had narcolepsy, headaches, and visions that would actually last the rest of her life. And Harriet was a devout Christian, and she took her visions as hearing God. Now, it could have been the result of her injury as well, but I'm not one to question one's faith. <laughs> Totally. Absolutely. <laughs> Around 1844, she married John Tubman, who was a free black man, and who, from our guide, uh, told us that John seemed to very much accept his place in life <laughs> and didn't want to escape. Uh, and he didn't want Harriet to cause any trouble or try to escape herself. But she did. <laughs> Of course she did. I know. That's why we're talking about it. Of course. <laughs> exactly. It was also around this time of her marriage that she actually started to go by Harriet, her mother's name. Uh, Harriet and her two brothers fled in 1849 after the death of their slave owner. And not wanting to wait around to see what the will or what the widow would do, they fled. But her brothers had second thoughts and they returned. Harriet soon escaped again, this time without her brothers. <laughs> and she made it to Pennsylvania, the glorious place of Phoebe. <laughs> <laughs> So I mean, I think it's cool, but I'm biased. So. Exactly. Be biased. Be stay proud. Okay. Okay. So now beforehand, though, uh, she tried to send word to her mother of her plans um, to escape using a coded song that she sang about about going to the promised land. Uh, while her exact route is unknown, this is when she found and made use of the Underground Railroad. 
In the fall of 1851, Harry returned to Dorchester County for the first time since her escape, this time to find her husband, John. She once again saved money from various jobs, purchasing a suit for him, and made her way to the South. John, meanwhile, had married another woman named Caroline. Harriet would even offer to take her too, but they both wanted to stay. So Phoebe, oh, you know a lot about the Underground Railroad. It is in it is in your backyard. <laughs> yeah, it really is. <laughs> so yep. yes, so tell me and tell the good people about the Underground Railroad. What was it? Okay, well, sixth grade Phoebe wrote that her or Harriet's passion was so great that she could not give up. And in 1849, she escaped to Philadelphia. And in Philadelphia, she went, met up with a man by the name of William Still, who was one of the Underground Railroad's busiest conductors. So the Underground Railroad was actually a secret route that led to the North that helped free slaves. Um, this informal but well-organized system was composed of free and enslaved blacks. These are the people that helped them, um, like white abolitionists and, their, um, and other activists who wanted to help free slaves. So these were like the railroad and the trails were all dependent on these people who were help who were helping everybody. Absolutely. It was very interconnected. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So these people um, were actually the ones that were called the quote unquote um, conductors. Mm -hmm. And as you traveled from stop to stop, each conductor would send you to the next safe house. This route was really hard and tricky and it was used by many people. So the farther north he went, the likelihood of being free became greater. So Harriet Tubman actually started her first journey by following the North Star. And by first journey, I mean her first journey alone without her brothers. Ah, uh, there you go. Yeah. Um, yeah. So she actually had to dodge people who were eager to collect rewards and of discovering escaped slaves because there was actually bounties out for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, she also had very little knowledge of the Underground Railroad at this time, so I can only imagine how difficult it would be to know who to trust and where to go. And oh, absolutely. Places to be, yeah. Staying in somebody's house and they're not going to tell anybody in the middle of the night. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that would be very difficult to trust them. Mm -hmm. um, and it was actually said that the conductors in the Underground Railroad used deception techniques um, to protect the slaves. So even that, it would be hard. Like, are they tricking people? Should I trust right. them still? Or am I just a slave? Because um, there was a story where at one of the early stops, there's this lady who ordered Harriet to go sweep out in the yard. So that mm. it would seem like Harriet was one of their slaves. Right. But it turns out that like, once the night came, then they the people hid her and sent her off to the next train station, basically. Right. So she had to trust um, them enough house. to, yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> to be like, oh, <laughs> That's I think I lot. know what you're doing, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I would be skeptical. I'd be like, I don't know. They're, I'm probably done by now. Mm -hmm. Like, this is probably how my story ends. <laughs> like, <laughs> no. So that's a, that's a lot of faith and trust both ways. Absolutely. So Harriet actually traveled from place to place and she observed things and she started to actually memorize the route, but they, we actually don't know what her very first route was because she was pretty right. secretive about it for the longest time. She crossed into Pennsylvania and that's basically as far as she had to go. She went to Philadelphia and by that point she was free basically. Nice. Um, right. And when she described how it felt to be free, she said, quote, when I found I had crossed that line. I looked at my hands to see if I was the same person. There was such a glory over everything. The sun came like gold through the trees and over the fields. And I felt like I was in heaven. I love that. Just the idea of looking at yourself and am I the same person? Um, right. That's really powerful. I mean, that just shows how right. dramatic of a change and a lift of weight that is. Absolutely. That's a huge burden off of your shoulders and can only imagine how that would feel like so freeing and so liberating you know oh absolutely and probably why she wanted to share that with other people once you experience something like that i would think that's something you want to share yeah mm -hmm. oh yeah <laughs> so when harriet made it to philadelphia she found different oddball jobs and she actually saved up money as she made plans to go back and save her family from slavery 
So in 1850, Harriet went back to save her sister and her sister's family and then brought them back to Philly. Um, the next spring after that, Harriet then helped her brother Moses and two others escape, which I think is really awesome. Absolutely. So Harriet became more confident as she helped more and more people. And in 1850, also, Harriet was named an official conductor of the Underground Railroad. Beautiful. Yep. So, 1850 was also the year of the Fugitive Slave Act. This act declared that any slaves that were captured were required by law to be returned to their owners. So, that means even Pennsylvania wasn't really safe anymore. Right. They could be captured, sent back. It became more tricky, and it made it vastly more dangerous and difficult to escape as a slave and remain in America. Yeah. So, to be free, they actually had to go farther north into Canada. Because of this, there's a part of the Underground Railroad, as we said, that cuts through the center of Pennsylvania, which is part of my town, which is awesome. Nice. Um, yeah. Well, it's awesome for me to have that history next to me. That's what I mean. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, yeah. So this is actually significant to me personally because there are roots and safe houses in my hometown, and they were part of the Underground Railroad. And there's even a road here that we call Freedom Road. And um, there's caves and different hiding places to, to hide slaves. And on Freedom Road, there's also a cemetery where nine African-American Civil War veterans are buried. Oh. And then, we, yeah, and we have stories about how alongside the river, um, there's caves and different th hiding places that um, they would go and actually the Indians in this area would also help them escape. Oh, very so cool. I just think that that history is just amazing. Yeah, that's a community coming together. I love that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So by 1851, the passengers of the Underground Railroad had increased, as well as the risk. So with the help of Frederick Douglass, actually, mm -hmm. Harriet Tubman helped slaves along the route to Canada. So they crossed Niagara Falls across this handmade bridge, and they found their freedom in St. In St. Catharines, Ontario, in Canada. So Harriet, of course, returned to America in 1852 to free more slaves. And by this time, she had freed so many slaves that, pe that she started to gather a sort of reputation. And the South was referred to the land of Egypt, and Harriet was referred to as Moses. And, um, yeah, it's taken off of the stories in the Bible, of course, where uh, Moses led the... Um, people out of Egypt. I think that's very so, cool. Yeah. I feel like secret codes and maps don't get talked about very often when we talk about the Underground Railroad, probably because it's mostly speculation, never really proven. I mean, they were secret codes, so it's not it's like going to pass right? that along. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's a secret. <laughs> so there's no real right way to prove these things. But um, there's some cool history, like, um, like quilts in the Underground Railroad, where they might have used them as mats, but there's also songs, um, and one of the songs is about Moses, and, um, it is said that Harriet would sing this one song, and depending on the tempo, it was either safe to proceed or not safe to proceed. Oh. And honestly, yeah, isn't that really cool? So it's the tempo that, that was kind of the the, the, the key yeah. to it, whether it's safe or right. unsafe. Oh, that's very cool. I always right, thought it was so, the song itself, but it's the tempo. Right, no, it's the tempo. And the song itself was actually common like in the Civil War and with different people, but it's the way that it was sung. Like if you look the song up, there's different ways, even just on YouTube, that it's... Um, oh, yeah, yeah. So so it's like, oh, well, I don't know. It, it's really cool. So, um, actually, I want I would like to sing my version of it yes, a little please, bit. Yes, please, please, please. <laughs> okay. So the song goes a little bit kind of like this. When Israel was in Egypt's land, let my people go. Oh, press so hard they could not stand. Let my people go. Go down, Moses, way down in Egypt's land. Tell old Pharaoh to let my people go. Very so cool. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> It it almost to me, you know what it kind of reminds me of is history repeats itself if we don't learn totally. from it. Totally. 
absolutely. You know what I'm that's saying? That's exactly what it's <laughs> that's, like. Yep. That's why it's got that kind of double meaning it where it's like, we've got to learn Right, this. we have to understand <laughs> that this is not okay, guys. It's not okay. Stop oppressing right. people. Right, just stop already, okay? <laughs> or we'll just exactly. go over and over. Or in like another hundred years, we'll be singing that song and it'll mean the same thing. It's like, no, guys stop uh, <laughs> like how about we how about we stop it right now? how about yeah. we just like recognize the pattern you know slow the slow our roll yep. try a new try a new story <laughs> exactly yeah. so over the course of eight years harriet went back and forth back and forth between maryland and canada and she actually freed around 300 slaves and took roughly about 19 trips although that we were debating wow. on that like Pro- maybe different more. Different sources different, say different yeah. things. And it, yeah, it could be more, could be less, but still. That's a lot. That, that, is, that is quite amazing. Yeah. Oh, oh absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my goodness. She was very, very serious about her work. If you wanted to be free, she would help you. But it took a certain level of trust, like we said, on both ends. And now she is on the conductor's end. She's the one who has to trust the slaves or to to trust her. You know, and now right. she's on the opposite end. And then those who she was freeing had to trust her to guide them safely. Mm-hmm. So there was an incident specifically where Harriet was leading a small group of people and one man wanted to turn back. She had reportedly pointed a revolver to his head and told him that he had no longer had a choice. They had to move on. So she said, dead men tell no tales. You go on or you die. It sounds very harsh, but... Honestly, if you think about it, it's a little understandable. And I'm sorry, Pirates of the Caribbean, but Harriet Tubman said it first. <laughs> she made it cool first. There you go. So does this mean <laughs> that she's a pirate too? I think pirates are awesome as well. Yeah. So let's say let's yes. Let's say yes. Okay, cool. <laughs> I'm glad we've established that one of our favorite American heroes is also a really cool yep. pirate. Yeah. That's okay. right. <laughs> this, this makes me so happy. <laughs> But she was doing what she had to do because if she let him just kind of, you know what I mean, go off from the others, uh, what if he was captured? He could easily give away their position uh, where they were. She would be no longer, you know, in control of the group to get them safe. So I completely understand it. That makes you a pirate. It does. Yeah. She actually didn't end up having... Uh, she didn't end up needing to shoot him, which is good. Thank goodness. Oh my goodness, yes. <laughs> like you said, like he could have been tortured. He could have been like anything, anything bad. Like it could, it was just mm-hmm. downhill if he left. And it's it's yep. said in some sources that this story could be an exaggeration, but I kind of doubt that it's an exaggeration because I. It's probably got a kernel of truth to it, if not the whole right, truth. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think that, I personally think that Harriet probably learned from her first escape attempt where her brothers decided, hey, we're turning back now. And she had to go back with them. Like, she had no choice. She's kind of been there, done yeah, that sort of so thing. she kind of <laughs> doesn't want to do it again, you know? Kind of mm-hmm. don't blame her. <laughs> <laughs> You're just going to come back later and do this. Let's just do it right, now. Right, <laughs> exactly. You're just going to try it later. So you may as well, you know follow through um but actually because she was so adamant and because she took it so seriously she was able to free over 300 slaves with no incidents like nobody was killed nobody was recaptured everything like they all made it to canada she said that she was able to say something that none of the other conductors were able to say And she said, quote, I was conductor of the Underground Railroad for eight years, and I can say what most conductors can't say. I never ran my train off the track, and I never lost a passenger. That is so cool. Like, wow. That is very cool. Yes. And it's super prideful as well. Oh, yeah. It's like, yep. She, yeah, I own that. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Like, own it, girl, though. You should, she should own that. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, because they're people. Right. That's the thing. Right. And people matter. People matter. So I love it. Me too. <laughs> so what should you do after the Underground Railroad, Kate? I mean, I know she wasn't just a conductor, even though that was a really awesome job. Like, she did so much more with her life. So can you tell us a little bit about that? 
Oh, yeah. Well, there was this little thing called the Civil War. Uh, It broke out in 1861. That's right. And Harriet, she she was all about it. She joined a group uh, of Boston and Philadelphia abolitionists to assist fugitive slaves in Port Royal, South Carolina, as a nurse. Uh, With the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, Harriet was determined to liberate Black men, women, and children from slavery. And she became a scout and a spy for the Union. This was something Something I did not learn in school. I didn't learn this either. <laughs> I actually didn't know any of this. This right? is really cool. <laughs> Isn't this amazing? And, and I can't too? believe just relatively recently we're finding <laughs> this out. This right. Crazy. So much depth of awesomeness to Harriet. <laughs> So her ability to be nearly invisible, it's really astonishing to me uh, because, you know, we have today's social media world of look at me, look at me, right? But Harriet, she she used that ability to maybe appear injured, maybe frail. Uh, She was a black woman, so she was kind of invisible, but yet she was always carrying a rifle at the time. Yeah, no, don't mess. (laughs) Which I find really awesome. But still, uh, she used all of this to her advantage uh, because nobody suspected her as a spy or as a scout. Uh, She led a band of scouts and she mapped the areas and she provided key intelligence that would aid to the capture of Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, Also in 1863, Harriet worked with Colonel James Montgomery with an assault on plantations for the Comanche River Raid. Now, Harriet knew this area. She knew she could get in before the plantation masters had any idea of what was going on. She knew that she could rescue slaves and lead them to freedom. Now, under Colonel Montgomery's orders and as a key advisor, Harriet became the first woman to lead an armed assault. I thought that was super cool. I didn't learn that until later in life, too. And I was like, what? But she guided three steamboats to avoid Confederate mines that were laid all throughout (laughs) uh, the the river that people had scouted out, herself included. Uh, They set fire to plantations, they seized food and supplies, and they rescued more than 750 slaves in that raid. Yeah, it was a lot. Uh, Her name was in the newspapers and her heroics inspired newly liberated men to join the Union Army. And as Harriet said later, I had never seen such a sight. She was so proud of this moment and those couple of nights of just going up and down the river, uh, avoiding mines and freeing people and setting fire to plantations. Maybe not the setting Maybe fire. Not. No, well, probably the setting fire. Yeah, no, probably. <laughs> that sounds kind of, I mean, yeah. But maybe. destroying the infrastructure. It was a war that was right, going on. Yeah. So destroying their supplies right. and their and their lifeline uh, to, you know, to outside so the Confederate didn't have a stronghold. Uh, was absolutely amazing, our glorious scout and spy. Uh, So, Phoebe, after the war, Mm -hmm. where did she settle and did she get married again? So, yeah, Harriet actually did settle. Um, She settled in Auburn, New York, and after the war in 1869, um, Harriet took in this, like, scraggly-looking man by the name of Nelson Davis, and he was just looking for shelter, and Harriet had provided the shelter for him. And um, he was a former slave, and he escaped through the Underground Railroad just like she did, and he served in the Civil War. Nelson was also a brickmaker, so he began working in Auburn as a brickmaker, and the more him and Harriet, like, spent time together, the more they were together, um, they fell in love. And even though he was 22 years younger than Harriet, they fell in love. And I'm just saying, I mean, that's good on you. I know, girl. right? <laughs> I'm like, okay. I'm just kind of, I'm kind of proud. I'm just, I'm just also kind of proud right, right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally. So they actually married in 1863 at the Central Presbyterian Church. Adorable. Right? They also adopted a little girl named Gertie, which that's what made my like voice go high pitched just then because it's so adorable. <laughs> like I was so excited. Gertie. Oh my gosh, little Gertie. <laughs> Like, I want to know about Gertie. Can I be Gertie? Anyway, I'm sorry. <laughs> I've seen pictures of Gertie yeah. at uh, at the museum. I saw one picture online and I was so excited. I'm like, yes, oh. I can see Gertie. This is so cool. I know. <laughs> so they, Adorableness. Yeah, so they adopted her in 1874 and then they raised her together. 
And Harriet and Nelson actually spent 20 years together before Nelson um, caught tuberculosis and then he died in 1888. But that's like a... no, Yeah. At least they had that time, Yeah, I'm right? just happy they had more than like, you know, a couple years. They had 20, 20 years. I'm like, yes. Yep. Yes, there's a, there's a good ending. Some happiness Yeah, there. there's some happiness. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes me... That makes me feel good. Absolutely. Um, But Harriet actually struggled for a long time receiving adequate funds for just living. Mm -hmm. And even with all of her work for the army and for her country, she didn't receive a government pension until her husband Nelson died. And even after that, it's like kind of sketchy on to when she got it. It doesn't sound like she got it right away. Mm -hmm. And the pension was um, for $8 a month. Gotcha. So, in 1898, Harriet petitioned the Congress for benefits for her own service in the Civil War, outlining her responsibilities during the war that she had as she was still receiving the pension for her, for her deceased husband. But by 1899, after receiving so many documents and letters and all these things for Tubman's claims, the U.S. Congress finally passed a new, and signed a new law and it authorized an increase of Tubman's pension to $20 per month for her service as a nurse. So that, that's Very really cool. good. Yeah. Absolutely. And <laughs> well deserved. Absolutely. She had to fight for it once again. Yeah, of course. Just like everything else. <laughs> yeah, she had to fight for it. Your girl's tenacious, oh, though. Oh, yeah. She, she got it, though, man. Um, <laughs> so glad. I love yeah. it. Um. Harriet also has um, a a lot of history within the women's rights as well. Um, And I was quickly learning about her at the Women's Rights Museum in Rochester. Um, But there was even more information at her museum in Auburn, too. Um, From the 1860s to the 1900s, Harriet actually spoke out in favor of women's rights to vote at suffragette meetings and events in New York and Boston and in Washington, D.C. When she and others were confronted with the racism in the National American Women's Suffrage Association, new organizations were created. Uh, In 1896, there was the National Association of Colored Women of Washington, D.C., and there was also the National Federation of African American Women in Boston. Oh, wow. Now, Harriet spoke not only of her life as a fight for equality, but also the sacrifices of countless women throughout history as evidence that women were deserving equality to men. And yes. I loved that. <laughs> yeah. She was also friends with Susan B. Anthony, who actually lived not too far away from her in New York. Uh, by car, modern day, it's 20 minutes from her house wow. <laughs> to Susan's house. Oh, oh yeah, awesome. absolutely. And and mm. Frederick Douglass was not that far away either because Susan B. Anthony and Frederick Douglass are buried in the same cemetery. Right. Um, so they all weren't that far away. There's such a, a, a wonderful seed of history that is right in there. Yeah. Um, But uh, Mm -hmm. Harriet and Susan, they both spoke out at women's meetings uh, together. But Susan was also helping Harriet with the Underground Railroad as well. So which was wonderful. Um, Ida B. Wells, who is a journalist, a suffragette, and one of the founders of the NAACP, actually called Harriet Mother Tubman. I always thought that was sweet. I like that one. She's taking care of all of us is kind of how that, you know, she's Mother Tubman. Um, As as Harriet uh, lay dying, she appealed to the suffragette organizer Mary Talbot to, quote, Tell the women to stand together, for God will never forsaken us. And I loved that. I know, right? So Harriet Tubman unfortunately died of pneumonia in 1913, around the age of 90, before being able to see women reach the right to vote, but after being able to see the freedom of her own people. She was buried with semi-military honors in Fort Hill Cemetery in Auburn, New York. And I visited, and it's lovely. I do have to say there is this, it was a rainy day while we were there, and there's this beautiful tree, do not know what it is, oak, birch, cedar, don't know, (laughs) Uh, don't know my trees. But it sheltered us from the rain Aww. while we were paying our respects. And it almost felt like she was kind of protecting us. Oh, you know so what I mean? Cute. If you yeah, kind of, totally. if you dig that yeah. way, because my little one was there and she was learning about Harriet yeah. and she just thought it was so sweet. She's like, it doesn't feel like rain underneath Harriet's tree. And I'm like, oh, my That's gosh. So sweet. <laughs> oh, my gosh. 
I I love know, it. right? I love how Harriet's just living on. And she had a, such a night. Nice, she had yes. a long life. Yes, and she did a lot she with did. it. She did. Good on She ya. used it up, man. She, she really, mm-hmm. wow. Oh, my gosh. That is a role model right Heck there. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. It's like, okay, who's so, your role model? Harriet Tubman. Okay, you got it. You got a lot to live yep, up to, man. Right. <laughs> oh, right. Working yeah. on it every day. Exactly. <laughs> Right. <laughs> so, Phoebe, what legacy do you think Harriet wanted to leave behind? Stepping yourself kind of in a, in her shoes a little bit, right, you know what I mean? Yeah. Putting myself in her shoes, she was like in fight or flight mode for a long time. Yeah. Thinking back on like her daughter and her siblings, children, I know that she she helped free them as well. I think maybe her, she wanted her legacy to be like, no, take a stand for yourself because we're human mm-hmm. too. No, we're we're human. So this is the these are our rights too, and you should take a stand for yourself. I think that that's really something that she wanted to push forth, and she wanted to help people. I I don't think she was all about mm-hmm. herself at all. I think she was just like, no. okay, now that I'm free. There's no reason these other people shouldn't be free. They need to be free, actually. She made it her mission. No, they need to be free. So that's what I'm going to do. I think she was focused more on that than she was being an inspiration because I think that she was purposely in the shadows most of her life. And then Mm -hmm. when she wanted to be out of the shadows, so to speak, it was only enough so that she could live. Like, she wanted recognition for her work. Mm -hmm. Because she couldn't, she didn't have enough um, money to live on. She just didn't have enough money to live on and she kind of, you know, went back into the shadows. And to motivate others too, because, you know, for the other causes that she was fighting for, if it was kind of like if her story was lending to that movement of a greater good of helping more people, she was about it. Yeah, exactly. What do you think her legacy she wanted to leave behind? I feel like the legacy she wanted to leave behind was uh, first and foremost the ability for her family to have a life away from slavery. Totally. Um, I think that was her first priority. If she could only leave something behind, it would be that her family would be free. But I think once she experienced freedom, she wanted to give that to others. I mean, during the Civil War, even by telling her story, um, I mean, during and after the Civil War of telling her story of the Underground Railroad and what she saw in the Civil War and telling that to anybody who would listen, she saw perceptions change. And she gave people hope that equality and basic human rights were deserved by all. Um, she, She even did work with Sarah Hopkins Bradford to publish a book as well. And the book was called Scenes from the Life of Harriet Tubman. And that was also a hope that her life would inspire others beyond her being there with us, basically. In later years, uh, she also hoped to open a home for the aged and indigent colored people um, because she wanted a home that would be open to all, regardless of being able to pay for their services. She wanted the elderly to be able to be taken care of. She saw how much her parents were struggling with this um, and she could take care of them. (laughs) And so it's like, well, what happens if you don't have kids that are nearby that can, you know, take on parents. We need to have a home for this. Um, So I see this through line of her entire life of always wanting to help others in need. And I feel that's heroic and I feel like it's noble and I feel like it's incredibly inspiring. Absolutely. Oh my goodness. (laughs) Yeah. So what did you learn from her? Because that's, that is always the fun part of these women that we, uh, that we take on is, is what, what kernels do we learn from them? What did you learn? Well, I think I kind of learned tough love from her. The story about her kind of pointing the gun to the, to the slave who kind of wanted to change his mind. That story really Mm -hmm. sticks with me because it's like, she didn't do it. You know, she, she didn't actually do it. But sometimes people need that tough love. Like, no, you need yeah. to you need to do this. You need to follow through with what you said you were going to do. And right. you're worth it. You know, you're worth doing this for. You deserve to be free. Yeah. So let's let's go get it. Let's go get let's go be free. You know, 
I mm-hmm. think, yeah, tough love is probably one of the biggest things I learned from her. And the fact that she kept going on. She wasn't done after the Underground Railroad. She wasn't done after the Civil War. She was never done. She kept yeah. she kept going. And having that persistence after having a hard life your whole life is so inspiring mm-hmm. and so much it's like we can we can take what we see from her and be like, okay, how how can I implement that drive and that love for other human beings outside of myself and how how can I learn from her and apply that to myself? Yeah, and even if you only get like one percent of what she right. had, that's that, a lot. That's a lot, <laughs> yeah. Like that's it's still worth shooting it for. It really is. It really is. <laughs> yep. Oh, I love mm. it. I for me, I I think I'm still learning from her, yeah. honestly. Um, she was far more active than me, and I strive to be pretty active. <laughs> uh, she saw solutions, and she went right into action, and I greatly admire that. Um, when I visited her home and museum in Auburn, and by the way, I did write an article on galsguide.org in the travel section, so you can find itinerary and totally. all that kind of Those good are stuff. really cool. Yay! We hope to do even more travel pieces because it is it really helps to to stand in the footsteps really to does. to stand where somebody of history uh, lived and it really does it really come alive. Does. So I, I love I'm it. I'm excited to to go back and add to your travel stories about Harriet and yes. add my own because. Please, yeah. please, yes. <laughs> we need more travel stories from more perspectives and more sites to add to the list because there's a lot uh, all over the country and all over the world of places uh, where you can learn about fantastic women. But when I was when I was there, when I was on that ground, right. I was really thinking about why, how, why, and how was this woman able to do so much, especially in a time when women, especially women of color were sidelined. And I really started to think it was because she was able to be invisible and visible when the situation called for it. She was always underestimated if she was even seen at all, which made it possible for her to do other things and to do things for other people. Now, those that saw her power, uh, those that helped her, that worked with her and encouraged her, uh, because people are attracted to people who do. Right, exactly. (laughs) When you do something, other people are attracted to that. Yeah, And Harriet didn't just do, but she made an impact. She didn't talk much, but she did uh, a great deal more. And I feel she's just such a remarkable rebel and a fiery woman. And she could have gotten completely forgotten to history. But I think because she was so heroic, her actions were so much for good, um, that that reminds the good in all of us. And I think that's why she's still taught in school. I think that she's she was so good and so heroic, we can't forget about Absolutely. her. Absolutely. <laughs> How could we? Yeah. yeah. And I'm happy about that. Uh, the other thing that I learned from her learning about Harriet's story, she, Harriet actually makes me think of my youngest daughter. Um, my youngest, she is the quietest among all of us. We're very talkative and very loud. Uh, she's also the most underestimated. She's unintentionally left out of conversations, but I feel that she has the biggest heart of all of us, and she's quite possibly the smartest Aww. of all of us. <laughs> So I actually see a lot of Harriet in my youngest daughter, and it just makes my pride swell, oh, yeah. like, out of my As heart. As it should. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I, I've met her, yeah. and I, can, I, I see the resemblance. I understand what you're saying. This is adorable. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, that quiet, kind of quiet, right. always listening, mm-hmm. you know, uh, always, uh, always aware of the situation, but kind of staying out right. of it. <laughs> Completely. Aww. But, uh, but you cross her, you hurt her, and she's like, nope. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> she comes alive and she's like, no, you're not hurting my sister, my mom. Like, she's, she's amazing. Yeah. I love her. <laughs> So do you have any final thoughts before we wrap up our gal Harriet Tubman? I'm just really thankful that we have gals like Harriet Tubman to learn from and that we actually know their stories because like you said, they could be lost and I would be so devastated if I didn't know. Well, 
I know you don't know what you don't know, but like Harriet Tubman. Your life is so much richer knowing her story that if it wasn't there, it's like, ooh. Absolutely. It's like, I would, I would, I would legitimately be a completely different person if I didn't know about Harriet Tubman. Like that is a complete, that is one of the truest things I've ever said. Like, like, she's, I can see that. Yeah inspired me in my life so much and she she's given me a heart for people that is hard to explain like what I feel for other people and for Mm -hmm. um people in general but I'm so thankful that that people like her exist and that they teach her in school and um I'm really excited that we can be able to spread the word about girls like her and Mm -hmm. be able to add to somebody else's learning because these kinds of stories are what make other people grow exponentially. Well, that wraps it up for us. Thank you for listening to Your Gal Friday. You can find out even more about Harriet Tubman and the upcoming gals that we're going to be covering at galsguide.org. If you like the show and find value in the gals that we cover, please subscribe, share, and visit our Patreon page. Links to everything are at galsguide.org. And we leave you with this quote from Harriet. I had reasoned this out in my mind that there was one of two things I had a right to, liberty or death. If I could not have one, I would have the other. For more information about this week's gal or to check out our previous episodes, visit galsguide.org. To support the show, visit the Gals Guide Patreon page. We've got great perks like behind the scenes, early access, and private live streams. Thank you so much for subscribing to Your Gal Friday.